Hey, what's happening and welcome to the very first episode of Life in the Mountain Pot. My name's Kareem and I'll be your host. So I created the space to generate an honest conversation about life growing up in multicultural Britain. Whilst doing my research, I came across loads of topics I wanted to talk about. There was one I think I had to start with because it affects everyone in their own way. And that's the topic of identity. A good friend of mine put me onto a book called The Good Immigrant by Nikesh Shukla. And this book is a culmination of essays by people of colour who are accomplished in the field. So you have journalists, authors, comedians, I think it's artists, etc. And going through it, there was one quote that I think summarises the book and summarises the tone of this uh, podcast really well. And it's a quote by Rennie Edo Lodge, and she's a British journalist and author. And she goes to say, To be an immigrant, good or bad, is about straddling two homes, whilst knowing you really don't belong to either. That alone resonates a lot with me because of my life. I was a second generation British Asian. I was born and raised in the South East of me. So it was 77% white, 8.4% Asian and 2.2% black. That alone tells you the sort of disparity between white British and ethnic minorities. So I had immigrant parents, I came from a working class background, and now I'm a working professional. I've questioned identity from a very young age, and there have been peaks and troughs about what I think is identity and what that means to me. And it's always been changing. But I wanted to touch upon a few of my life experiences, which I think some of you will resonate with or some of you can learn from. My first experiences of racism was actually in primary school. So it was in the parking lot. My dad was reversing. A builder was behind him. There was an altercation where my dad didn't see the builder. Stop. He got out of the car. The guy then turned around and said to my dad, basically, when you're in my country, you follow our rules. And the guy didn't have any shame because he can see his, my dad with a kid. He completely ignored sort of the moral high ground. But this was in the um, early 2000s. And I think things have changed since then and it was a bit different. And I didn't really understand it back then. But that kind of a questioned, is this my country or is this not my country? Because my dad is someone who has a British accent, but it's obviously brown. So it sort of resonated with me. You know, I have a British accent. I'm brown. But this guy is saying, this is my country. So... Obviously, it caused some confusion for, I think I was about 10 years old at the time. And the majority of my primary school, you're pre- pretty oblivious to racism. You're pretty oblivious to any racial tension or bias or anything like that. So, it was pretty ignorant sailing for me at that point. But I think secondary school is when I became consciously aware of everything. And secondary school for me was somewhere that, where there was a lot of racial tension. So, we went to a school which was predominantly working class. It seemed like it was like 40% Asian, 40% white, and the rest other. So black and other minorities. And the first day I remember we walked into school, we were in year seven. And there was a fight in school, which tend to be the norm in our school. We walked over to the fight, and we were a bit stupid, and we were wide-eyed, and we walked towards the fight. And a kid came up against a fence and said to us, You effing packy, and spat in our direction and then we were just a bit taken aback because we've never been outright called out like that before but it was something that really sits with me because it kind of set the tone for my school life because it was basically it just happened to be fights between Asians and whites and it went just back and forth and it was something that gave me an understanding of right we're the foreigners here we're someone that's a pest to these people and we really don't belong here so we kind of stuck to ourselves and we were just leaning on each other for support and to be honest it's not a great way of thinking about things but we had to learn from it we had to grow from it and it kind of shaped our expectations of the world going forward because all we knew is school at the time but going from there there was a completely different struggle and this was in college we went to a very middle class college in Winchester. So coming from a largely Asian school, getting chucked into a largely white middle class college was a eye open, honestly. On top of having sort of awareness of being an ethnic minority, the economic status played a big part. So, you know, these were middle class kids. We were working class kids. That in itself just clashed with our way of thinking. And uh, I remember one of our friends was from another school and he was good I think his friends were white said to him why are you hanging out with the black lot you know in my head we were thinking if you're gonna be ignorant or if you're gonna be racist at least be correct call us brown not not black so we made a joke about loads of things back in the days and that's the way we cope with things from a very young age this is all we thought about we thought about we were outcasted we were disenfranchised we weren't a part of society we had to rely on our own people and own way of thinking basically 
there was something else that really confused me as well. So there was someone from another school, and they were uh, they were brown, but they were Pakistani, and uh, they went to a largely majoritarily white school. And I remember in conversation we used the word Paki, and they said to us, "Oh, you can't say that. You're not Paki." You know, it confused me so much because obviously growing up, that's all we were called. We were called Paki, and we were pretty much put in that bubble, regardless of what your ethnic background is. So I'm Bengali, but we have friends who are Indian, friends that are Pakistani, but we all grouped in one label, basically. So for someone to say that to us was, first of all, took me back, but second of all, made me made me angry because this was a label that was put on me and now I'm being told I can't use it. And in hindsight, to be fair, no point of really using it. But at the time, it affected me in such a way. Um, I think college taught me one thing. It taught me about changing my, my way of thinking, changing the way I spoke to people and adapting to social situations. So I quickly realised that if I wanted to survive in society, I had to adapt to social situations. So the way I spoke to my friends and the way I spoke to my family were different to the way I spoke to my peers. And also when I was working, it changed the way I spoke to my work colleagues. You know, a social adaptation makes you question sort of your identity because you start to think about there's something called code switching, which Rizarman touches on. And Rizarman, the actor I'm talking about, it's a way of changing the way you speak, you dress, the way you carry yourself in different social situations. And I think it confuses kids or it's just something that as an Asian, British Asian kid, you just have to get used to. And so a lot of the time you think to yourself, who am I? Because when you're with your Asian family, you have festivals, you have family gatherings, you know, people play Asian music and you feel Asian, right? But then you go and sit down with your friends and we all communicate in English. We might be from different backgrounds, but you all communicate in English, but we're Asian. So then we kind of think to ourselves, we're British Asian. And going forward, speaking to sort of my work colleague, we change our mannerisms, we talk in a bit more of a polite way less slang and then you think to yourself i'm changing myself a bit too much i'm not like these people you think of yourself as asian again so it is a pretty confusing situation i'm pretty sure a lot of you guys will think the same going on to sort of uni actually so i was working part-time in sainsbury's whilst i was in uni and i was at the checkout and i remember this one time a young kid must have been about eight or nine he was with his dad and so i was checking out their stuff and he turns around and says to me why are you here? And I said, what do you mean I work here? And he goes on to say, no, why are you in this country? And obviously, I was taken a bit back. I, I was speechless. And I looked at the dad to say, are you going to say anything? But he was laughing. And I was thinking to myself, right, okay, now I know where it comes from, right? It's the dad, it's the way he thinks. He passed on to a kid. And it's a shame. So there was another moment where I was at the checkout and I was speaking to a guy. And he started talking about the history of in the Indian subcontinent, but Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and he acted like I should know these things. And to be honest, probably should have, but growing up in England, we don't really get taught about these things. So I was quite confused. But that led me on to thinking I need to connect to my roots a bit more. I really need to start understanding about the history, really need to start understanding about where I'm from, why I'm here. But another thing that I want to speak to you about, because I spoke about that, is actually about the education within the UK. We often think about why we're here, but the education system should really teach us about the British National Act in 1948, which allowed all Commonwealth countries to access Britain after World War II, because Britain needed help to reconstruct the country because so many people were lost at war. And I think the education system should touch upon subjects like, for example, India supplied the largest voluntary army in the world. And this was in World War I, and also supplied raw materials. Now, we never get taught that. We always get taught about the British, the Germans, the French, the Russians, the US, predominantly Western countries. You know, we don't get taught about the colonies which helped. And that shapes society and that shapes everyone's view of who we are. Rather than someone that's helped the cause, we're people that were nowhere near during the war and nowhere near helping the people, so we're lucky to be here. And I think education needs to change to include us. And also a lot of people ask, why are you here? What connection do you have? Obviously the British Empire was huge. And the British Empire invaded India, but initially was the East India Company and the British government took over. Through there, they obviously committed heinous act. They ruled through divide and conquer. They created divisions throughout the whole land. And it's something that affects the Indian subcontinent today. 
another thing I wanted to speak about. So going through the the book, The Good Immigrant, there was a teacher who spoke about teaching a year two class. So this was Darren Chetty, and he talks about children's books. It's a really interesting one because I didn't think about this. So children's books have predominantly white characters. So he was thinking about this and he asked his year two class, I want you to write a story and I want you to use names of people in your family because he knew that he had a class which were majoritively ethnic minority. And obviously there's going to be ethnic minority names if he asked them to. They went away, they wrote their stories and what he found was only one child in his class used a name that wasn't British or white British. And he thought to himself, why is that? So when this child went to go say a story, a kid interjected and said, oh, you're not allowed to do that. All the characters in children's books have to be white. To me, that blew my mind. But he goes on to say, children's books are like windows into someone else's lives. And if you don't teach kids that these experiences and these lives can relate to them, then they're going to feel disenfranchised at a young age they're not going to relate to these characters and if they do they're going to think that's how society is and you might be thinking about the year two his experiment on his own taught us that kids are affected by it they do see color they do see race and i know there's a few books that came out at the moment um noughts and crosses that was huge which was one of the very first books to use ethnic minority characters is something that I was only aware of. And I think that's a really big stepping stone to helping shape people. But going on to sort of representation, one thing growing up is we did not have any representation on TV, right? Let's be honest, a lot of us British Asians, because we didn't have representation in the British media, we turned to the US. We turned to shows like The Fresh Prince, The Cosbys, a bit before my time, and My Wife and Kids. And the reason we did that is because it showed a reality outside white Britishness. It showed us people who were successful, who were funny, who told their own stories, which weren't the same stories we'd been fed all our lives, right? But whilst growing up, I have to shout out a few shows and a few movies that really represented us, and I think it's awesome. So The East is East is a big one. Goodness Gracious Me. Uh, there was another one, Ben La Beckham. Huge one, everyone knows about that. But there's a few things on Channel 4 that really helped me during, I think it was secondary school at the time. Channel 4 was really representing normal Asians. So there was a movie called... The Road to Guantanamo, which was huge. I think it won an award at the Berlin Film Festival. And there's another one called The Bradford Riots. Um, whether or not, you know, they, they showed Asians in a good light or bad light. Just showed normal Asians who were from Britain that had their own personal stories. And it really gave us some sort of representation in the media. And I think that's what it comes down to. It comes to representation in the media because you don't want to feel like you're not a part of Britain, you don't want to feel like you're not being seen. I think that's really important. Going on to do some more research, I came across a speech by Riz Ahmed and it was on diversity and it was in 2017 in front of Parliament at the Oxford University. And he came up with a few points that I think still resonate today. So he says that through representation, people feel like they belong and seen in society. If you're not showing yourself on TV, you then think to yourself, you're not a part of the society or people don't view you as a part of society and you're just an outcast, which is really true, really important. The other thing he said is Britain has changed, right? Britain is now a new melting pot of culture and tradition. And what was once seen as British is now change and everyone's got a story and everyone's helping towards this new story so what's britain's new story going to be is it going to be one that looks inward so one that involves the same same way of thinking the same britishness the same social structures or is it going to include us is it going to include the british asians i think that's what i'm really looking forward to i'm looking forward to a time where the british media say do you know what we're going to include everyone we're going to show their story we're going to show you you are a part of this country you're a part of society and his his speech although it's on diversity he says i don't like to use the word diversity because it feels like something on the side. It feels like the fries and not the burger. So he liked to use the word representation. And do you know what? Bang on. I think representation, that's what we need to use. And he then goes on to say a few things. If you do not show people in the media, it leads to people feeling outcasted. It leads to people going into sort of extremism. 
that's a complete topic on its own but it makes people feel outcast they then go to things that they think they're connected with causes in people to have different thoughts and antisocial thoughts which i can see where it's coming from but that's another topic on its own i'm not going to go into that so after thinking about all of this i'm thinking how do we overcome this How do we come to a point of this is my identity, this is where I'm from, and this is what I'm secure with? One of the books that I came across that kind of changed my mindset on this was a book called Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. And there was a section on there where he talks about the legend of Persia. And what he says is, uh, so humans can only intimately know gossip and have relationships with 150 people. And this was before society, you know, countries and cities, etc. So he goes on to say, how did Homo sapiens go on to create these mega cities in countries? And he says, there's something that human beings can do that is different from every other species in the world. And that create fictional social constructs. What he says is, we're the only people that can create a concept which is not really there, but we believe is matter of fact. The legend of Persia, going back to it, Kurt Persia car manufacturer first started off as a concept. So although it manufactures cars and there's warehouses, the actual name Persia, the company itself, is only a concept, right? You know, it can be put on a piece of paper, but it isn't a physical thing. And that's because we create this identity Persia. And that can be with anything. It can be with law and order. So law and order isn't a real thing. It's just a concept we created and we believe as now matter of fact. So if you think about it, the same thing can be, can be said about title so british asian right now we might not think british asian is a part of british society yet but if we as second third fourth generation british asian can think to ourselves actually i am a part of british society the term british asian is just in british as everyone else and we can coin that term and we can create a concept and we can believe in that concept and we can pass on that concept to our children and they can pass on that concept to their children it will become matter of fact i think it will help with that identity crisis of who are we where do we belong and that in itself can culminate a lot of things it doesn't have to just be we're a part of britain because we just have british values or the the old term british values but it can be these people are those who are just as a part of british society as everyone else yes they might have cultures from different countries but that's what makes britain that's what makes britain better and that's what adds to the country and hopefully that's what i'm going with from now on i'm British I'm born here I'm raised here I might have different cultural identities that I tangle with every now and then but it's all comes to one thing it comes back to the country and it benefits the country right guys thank you for listening I think I'm gonna leave it there so I'm signing off Uh, follow me on my Instagram page life in the melting pot dot podcast let me know what other topics you think I should talk about and whether you think these are good conversations or whether i can prove anything once again thank you for listening and i will talk to you soon